morning, church. It's great to be with you this morning for worship. Uh, we are, want to welcome you here to First United Methodist Church, Midlothian. Uh, it is so great to get to share in this time of lifting high the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to welcome one another who are worshiping with us live in the comments. It's always good to see the names of, of our people um, show up. We're so grateful for all of our guests and members alike who have joined us today. If you also have any prayer requests, feel free to put those in the comments. And I know that we as a church will be faithful in lifting one another up to God. Today is a special day in which we celebrate communion. So we're gonna have a time in our service where we encourage you uh, to go into your kitchen and to grab the elements of bread and, and juice and bring those um, and get ready to celebrate communion. So it's always an incredible gift to re remember God's grace given to us in Jesus Christ. As we move into this time of worship, we do so with the mindset that is displayed in John the Baptist. When his followers saw Jesus was baptizing more people than John and thought that the whole world was flocking to Jesus and no longer to John, they asked John about that. And John simply said, it is time for him to increase and for me to decrease. May we adopt the same posture as we enter to worship. May Christ increase among us and may we decrease. Good morning, church. It is amazing to be back here with you this morning. Uh, thank you all for the prayers and, and the cares that I've received during my recovery. But uh, it's just such a blessing to be back here before you. So join me in singing Victory in Jesus Hymn 370. of ages cleft for me. Thank you. 
Now let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to invite Joe Faulkner up as he will sing one day at a time and I just want to thank Joe for for filling in for me at least last three weeks so enjoy our special song by Joe this morning
Let us pray. Lord, what you can see is far greater than that ground level view we have. You've created all things, things that we can see and can't see. Relationships we have had, have and will have. People to love and will be loved by us. But our perspective is often limited to what we can see, touch and hear. We can't see the perfection of your kingdom as it plays out in the community of faith. Lord, turn us towards your perspective unlimited, kind and wise beyond our ability to see it. Teach us the power of your people that comes from within, comes from the body of Christ. Show us how the gifts from you can be used to best serve you first. And give us the insight to see the spiritual potential in your people. We are in awe of you, Lord. Shine your light upon us so that we may see what you see and what you see in us. Strengthen our resolve to follow your son's example and let everything that we do honor and glorify you. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, as we come to the time of proclamation, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. We are continuing in a sermon series on Romans chapter 12, talking about what it really means to be the church. And so let us hear these words from the Apostle Paul. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If I were to ask you to define the church, what would you say? I guess technically I just asked you a hypothetical question, but let me rephrase that since I went ahead and already asked you for a definition. What does it mean to be the church. As you're thinking about your own definition, I'll go ahead and give you mine. The church is a transformed community seeking to live into the fullness of life in Christ and in service to Christ. 
Now, in all fairness, I've had a lot more time to work on my definition than you have yours. But I think it's important for us to think about what we believe it means to be the church. You know, I think there's this tendency to think of the church in very casual terms as though we're you know, just a body of believers who, who all just happen to share faith in Jesus Christ under one roof. Maybe we come here because we like the music or the pastor or the food or maybe the people in our Sunday school class. But the church is really more than just that. You see, the church is a body of redeemed sinners bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We come together by the blood of Christ and, and in service to Christ. We come together under the Lordship of Jesus, seeking the Holy Spirit to work within us in such power that we are, in, we are able to embody the kingdom of God in our midst. That God's kingdom and values and character are demonstrated in the way in which we live and treat one another. This is what it means to be the church. So we get into Romans chapter 12, we see the Apostle Paul begin to teach us once again about what it means to be the church. We begin in verses 1 and 2, and, and Paul begins to talk about the spiritual attitude that accompanies the people of God. He speaks about what it means to be a living sacrifice, that we have all committed ourselves to be living sacrifices, to live lives that are holy and pleasing to God, so rooted deeply in his love that the life of Christ begins to be manifested in our own being. He also goes on to speak of the transformation that we are continually undergoing as God's children in verse 2. That part of what is being changed in us is a renewing of our mind. That we're beginning to think about ourselves, about God, and about others differently in accordance with the mind of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul moves from verses 1 and 2 and, and this kind of individual decision that we have each made to become living sacrifices undergoing a transformation by God's grace to the communal living out of that decision. He talks about what it means that as a community of people who have made these individual decisions yet collectively share this value together of what it means to live that out. As we move into verses 3 through 8, we see what is perhaps the most important characteristic of actually living out this decision that we've made to follow and serve Jesus Christ. For Paul, this attitude is one of the most critical if we are to be a fruitful church living out kingdom priorities in our midst. And here's what he says in verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. So here in verse 3, Paul is addressing this human tendency to think too much of ourselves and to think about ourselves too much. Now, I want to say that again so we don't miss it, because this is what kind of undergirds verses 3 through 8. And if you don't get this point, you're going to miss what Paul's saying. Paul is speaking to the tendency to think too much of ourselves and to think of ourselves too much. We know that when we do this, when we begin to think too much of ourselves and think too often of ourselves, we know that what we begin to do is instinctively begin to elevate ourselves. To think of the self is to begin to seek to elevate the self, especially above others. Now we know we see this all throughout our culture. We live in a culture that values competition and we're always seeking to compare ourselves to others. 
In fact, we use markers of our own making to compare our lives and essentially our value to other people that we see. We often think about using salaries and what money we make, the size of houses we live in or where we live, the size, the kind of cars that we drive, the positions that we hold, the kind of time that others need from us. We use all of these kind of things and more to kind of elevate ourselves above others. And we're not prone to doing that just in our lives outside the church. We do the same thing even in the church. We can take good things and even begin to twist them for these kinds of purposes. There are some of us who pride ourselves on being uh, the most valuable in the community of faith because we do more than others. It's easy for us to begin to find ways to elevate ourselves in any way that we can. And this is what Paul's addressing in the church in Rome. You see, the church had begun to develop this kind of internal list of which spiritual gifts and what kind of service was more valuable to God. And they did this in order to kind of establish a pecking order where, of course, those in power who made the rules would come out on top of all the others. And to this, the Apostle Paul says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. You see, what Paul is saying is he's saying, don't super think of yourself. In other words, don't think too much of yourself and don't think of yourself too much. You see, what Paul is he's pointing to here is the idea of the renewing of our minds. That those who are being transformed by the grace of God will continue to see themselves in light of God's grace that's working in them. In other words, they'll remember that who they are apart from the grace of God, therefore will continue to occupy a mindset of humility about themselves and who they truly are apart from identity to Christ. What I find interesting about some of the vocabulary that Paul chooses to use here in verse 3 is that actually the word he uses for think is tied to sanity and thus insanity. That's why the Phyllis Bible translates verse 3 as, as this, but make a sane estimate of yourself. In other words, don't be crazy. In light of, of God's grace, it is insane to think about even elevating yourself above another person. I mean, let's think about it for a moment as we turn our attention to the one we know as the head of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ. We know from Philippians 2, the passage I quote to you probably every other week, you know, is, is that Jesus himself chose a position of humility to give himself as a low servant as a sacrifice for you and for me, then it is insane to think of elevating ourselves above our, of others. In a community that is defined by this kind of spiritual posture, how can we even begin to think of elevating ourselves above others? If you look deeply beyond this mindset, we know that to try and elevate ourselves above another in the church is really trying to elevate ourselves above Christ and the position that he chose. You see, Paul is calling us to follow the model of Jesus. That if Jesus gave himself as a servant, taking a position of humility, being humbled to the point of death on a cross, then how can we choose anything less? Therefore, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. You see, Paul goes on to talk about how this mindset of humility should shape our understanding of what it means to be the church. As he goes on to talk about service and how humility must be present in order that pride won't overwhelm and thus 
make toxic our service in the church. He talks about spiritual gifts. And what Paul essentially goes on to say in these verses is that we have all been given spiritual gifts. That each of these gifts are to be celebrated, not compared. They're to be exercised, not for our glory, but for the glory of God himself. Because as a church, we, we live not for the individual, but for the kingdom of God. And this is the mindset out of which we serve. We give ourselves as those in service to a great and glorious king. I remember hearing a great illustration of this mindset from Hudson Taylor, who was perhaps the most famous missionary to China. He served in the 1800s for over 51 years in China, was attributed to establishing over 215 schools there in China, and had reached over tens of thousands of people for Jesus Christ. He was invited one time to speak to a church in Australia, and as he was about to come to the pulpit, the pastor gave this just amazing, glowing introduction of, of Mr. Taylor. Uh, and he said, we want to welcome our illustrious guest. When Mr. Taylor came to the pulpit, he began his sermon by saying this. He said, dear friends, I am but a little servant of an illustrious master. That's what Paul means when he says, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. You see, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice is to willingly choose a posture of humility. It is to choose a like life of sacrifice, which means setting self aside. This is what it means to be the church. And if we want to offer a ministry that is fruitful and faithful in God's kingdom, this must be our attitude, individually and collectively. And as we get ready to come to the table today, my prayer is that communion might be for us one of those practices that helps us remember that we are called to be living sacrifices, to set aside self, to use Jesus' words elsewhere in the gospel, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily, and to follow him. To offer our lives that God might make us new, transform us inside and out, that the service we offer to God is faithful and pleasing to him. So as we get ready to take communion, I'll invite you as Paul comes up to sing and share music again. If you want to go into your kitchen, if you don't already have the resources in front of you to grab bread or crackers, whatever you have, and juice of any kind, and we'll share the gift of communion together. Let us begin to get in the mindset. Thank you, Pastor Brady. Please join me in singing hymn 620, One Bread, One Body. We'll sing verse 2. <laughs> One cup of blessing. 
we come to the table, we are mindful of the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us. Now here we grab one loaf, which is representative of not only the body of Christ, but also of the church. We come together under these elements to remember that we are the church. And though we are not gathered physically together here in this morning, we are united together spiritually which is the most important connection that we share, that we are come together under the life of Christ and in faith in who he is. We come to offer ourselves today as living sacrifices. We know Christ in the night in which he gave himself up for us, took the bread among his disciples and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And that same night he took the cup and after raising it towards the heavens and blessing it said, this is a cup of a new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, drink in remembrance of me. As we come to the table, we are grateful for the mighty acts of God displayed in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we come to share these elements, we know that we are sharing in the life of Christ himself. And so we come with hearts that are full and grateful. We come under a posture of humility, knowing that none of us deserve the grace represented at this table, yet we are all invited to share. That in sharing it, we are made one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. And so we pray, with the Holy Spirit be poured out on these gifts of bread and juice, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that as we receive them, we might truly be the body of Christ in every meaning of the word. Amen. I'm going to invite you at home to take the bread, which is the body of Christ broken for you. I want you to break a piece off for those you're with, We'll take the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you and for me, and we invite you to dip the bread in the juice and receive. And we invite you to share with all who are there. As we receive, let us offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, how grateful we are for the life that you have given on our behalf and in glory to your Father. We pray as we receive that we too might offer ourselves as that living sacrifice. We might choose to give of ourselves and continue to live out of a spirit of humility, knowing who you are and knowing who we are in light of you. Help us to offer ourselves not in a desire to elevate ourselves over anyone, but to offer ourselves in humble service to you, that we might truly bring you glory. For this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today in worship. What a joy it has been to share in this time together uh, with you. I uh, want to also encourage you to continue your, your worship by giving to our church. Uh, there's a link in the comments below to do that uh, to our website. I just want to commend you again for being such a faithful church. Uh, you've been so diligent in giving and helped us continue to expand ministry in what is really an unprecedented season. And we are continuing to reach more people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing to see those we're connecting with um, both in the states and beyond. So thank you for, uh, for your faithfulness in our church. Also wanna encourage you to look at our resources online, to know our services are always online on our website and on Facebook. Wanna encourage you to share any of these resources with your friends. Right now is the easiest time to invite your friends to attend church because all they have to do is click on a link. And so please, if these are meaningful to you, please share our worship services, our discipleship resources, our waypoints, our children's and youth resources, whatever they are that mean something to you, share them with your friends. It's a great way to connect people with our church and ultimately to Christ himself. 
I also want to make you aware of July 19th, we're still looking at coming back on the 19th um, to in-person worship outdoor in our courtyard at 7.30 a.m. Look for more announcements uh, in the week to come about what that looks like and coming back. But we invite you to continue to be prayerful about that and as we look to make that step as a church. Um, but we invite as we come to this time that we leave this space and this time as the body of Christ seeking to embody Jesus, not only here in this place, but in our homes and in our lives outside, that others may come to know the grace in which we are so privileged to know. Amen.